Hello, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Oh, let me share my screen. Uh, this is Jim McKeith, and welcome to All About Linux and Advanced FireMonkey. This is the roundtable Q&A to go along with the playlist that you all received a link to earlier in the week. Ideas today, we can discuss this topic in more detail, answer any questions you may have had from the uh, videos you watched, and uh, also just go off on tangents about related things as well. Uh, to help me with this conversation, I have two of our fabulous MVPs online with me today, Ian Barker and Frank Lauder. Uh, Ian, you want to go ahead and say hi? Hello there. I'm not as scary as my picture looks. <laughs> I, I tried to find a really scary picture for you. Well, you know. I definitely look like I'm going to uh, attack somebody with a broken compiler or something, yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm nice, and, really, honestly. <laughs> and Ian, you're, you're in Texas, right? That's great. Yeah, very rainy Texas at the moment. Yes, Dallas, uh, just north of Dallas. All right. And Frank, joining us from Germany. Yes, hello from Germany. And Ian, uh, you're looking like you'll find a bug. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, my code never has bugs. That's obvious. Oh, of course not. Of course not. <laughs> you found a code in some, or bug in someone else's code, obviously. That's yeah, of course. Like it. That's exactly it, yeah. <laughs> and that's an older picture of me, although I still have that hat. And Frank was telling me he had something he'd like to show off really quick here. So um, I can show you here uh, my, my main application for my company, and I have many versions here. I started this application um, with XA2, and uh, yeah, with XA4, it's... Uh, I, I managed to get it running on, on Android and on Windows and on OS X and also on Ubuntu. And the funny part was after the FMX Linux part was in the Get It repository to download the stuff for UI uh, Ubuntu Linux uh, distribution, um, I had just to make some little adjustments to my project. I can show you the problem here um, and you see uh, this was the only part this was missing to to get my app running because uh, i use notification and also sensors and everything else but uh, this was not included in the uh, rtl uh, from from stock so i had to put in some kind of notification empty stuff here just to get it running and uh, the funny part is, I can do a fresh build here. Yeah, that's one thing I found is that oftentimes it's FMX Linux. It's like if you if you're already doing uh, FireMonkey, then FMX Linux just works. <laughs> yeah, it is just the the system units that are missing um, with with empty uh, implementations, of course. Um, and you can see it's it's compiling everything, uh, no adjustment to the other parts of the code. And uh, yes, it's uh, it's a huge app. So this was previously FMX for Windows and OS X, it looks like, right? Um, it it was it was similar to to this, yes. Uh, but I managed to get it running on Windows OS X. Uh, iOS and Android um, okay. because of my underlying framework, uh, which is able to manage frames and frames and, and apparent uh, stuff. Uh, so you can embed uh, Windows also on the Windows system uh, like you expected on the mobile stuff. Because on mobile you have always uh, full screen mode and um, of course on the desktop platform uh, OS X, Windows and Ubuntu you do not have this kind of full screen. So I embedded everything into each other with some little frame management and uh, yeah, it's working. <laughs> and you see, it's it's uh, one hundred seventy thousand each each files, and um, I can I can show you what's different. So I hope this will work to switch over to Ubuntu. Yep, we can see Ubuntu on the screen. That's good. 
Here, as people are commenting that the text is a little small. Um, actually, that looks better there. I don't know if there's a. What okay, so. Well, I think, I, I think, sorry, Frank, I think um, your other VM's a little bit um, small. I think um, probably resize it if we go back to it. But it's fine at the moment. This, this Ubuntu one is a little bit more visible, so that's good. Okay, uh, strange. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so um, it's, it's uh, of course, a German application for my customers. And I can just hit start here. And um, yes, it's it's an application for some kind of. Um, I, I see. I, I think the name is called bailiff. So if you um, know this term, and yes, it's 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 running fine. You can see I can do everything here. Um, I can do some fancy stuff here, like. Uh, um, You see, um, I can type here, and uh, the left, uh, sorry, the right side you see here, um, it's uh, my own rendering engine. Oh, you're filling I out the form. I do not use any kind of report stuff. It's uh, my own report engine here. I really um, like the green bar. You, the green bars you had there at that one screen. That was a nice touch. Yeah, and you see, uh, and it's uh, if you click here, it's live updated in the preview here at the Etsy site and everything else. Very um, good. Yeah, and you can of course type here, and you see the the yellow part. If 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 I put in more text, it's uh, growing, um, and I, I of course I can print it also. Um, are those um, are those custom components that you were just typing into, or are they um, standard components? This 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 is this is all stock. I okay. do not use any third party components for this. Okay. Um, I did not try it. We can we can test it if we um, it, perhaps it oh uh, perhaps some kind of stuff is missing here let's see yeah i can show you the styling i, I don't I can kind of show you the styling yeah so uh, as you can see it's working and um everything you see here from from uh screens uh from menus from oh here we go oh it's selected um everything this what is rendered here at the screen. Oh, here we have the dark mode. So the dark mode switch has kind of function, but not really. Okay, never mind. Everything you see here is just rendered out of the box, out of a database. So there's no static content in this app at all. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. So um, sorry for the German stuff, but uh, switch back hey, to light. I, I don't think it's a problem. <clears throat> and where, can I just ask a couple of questions? So, on this app, um, do you render the user interface as a separate thing? So, do you use like a model view controller kind of architecture, or you said you render everything on the fly? So, you know, uh, dynamically. So maybe that doesn't apply. But um, it, did you separate out all of the business logic um, separately, and that made it easier for you to? Um, convert the app to mobile and desktop because you know obviously this is a, a Linux desktop or, or or did you have to do something special? Okay, um, first of all, you see I, I can show you some kind. Of, give, give me a second um, to get it clear. Um, I can you see the three uh, three uh, parts: the, the left one, the middle one, and the right one. Okay. Uh -huh. If you if you imagine this is not a desktop application, imagine this is an iPad or an Android pad in portrait mode, okay, uh, in landscape mode, okay. Um, the size of these panels here, this one and the middle one and the right one, is the same as you can imagine. You have three iPhones each, uh, 
for each of the screens. Okay, so you can see this is one. The left one is one scaling for iPhone. The middle one and the right one. And I can show you what's what's changing. So if I start the app and resize the app to some kind of iPhone-ish uh, screen resolution, okay, um, and start the same. You can see everything is working, except right. if you click here, you get the middle one. If you click here, you, you get the right one and you can go back. And the same for the stuff we just saw. You click here, you say, okay, work with it. You get the left stuff. You can click here, you get the uh -huh. middle stuff. And you can also do the same. And that's the trick. The main screen has three layout containers to contain everything uh, if you have a desktop or an iPad in, in, in landscape mode. And if you have some kind of iPhone or Android phone, it's rendered on, on page controls, uh, tab controls uh, for each other, uh, each frame separate and do the uh, uh, moving stuff here. And uh, there's no preview of the of the rendering context, of course. So you can select here, and it's rendered um, in 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 real time uh, here on uh, for for this stuff. And pretty, the funny part is, well. you, I can I can grow it on on a Windows. I can grow it, and you see, oh, here's the trick. <laughs> okay, and yeah. of course Are it's scaling. Like view there it's all your own controls the team it's, will tell all, you. it's all stock it's all stock it's just um uh, uh, layouts uh images uh scroll boxes that's it huh. and 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 the the preview here of of all these stuff here it's not it's not it's just out of the box from a database this is all rendered by a database and um every every part between the horizontal lines. Okay, it's a little bit strange for the font. I can show it on Windows. Um, everything is rendered in different threads. So if I update something, every part between the lines is rendered in a different thread. And that's why it's so fast. And you see, I have no problem of scrolling or everything else. Sure. I mean, it, it looks like it functions properly under Linux, which is really good. and. And yeah, there are a couple of things, you know, like the font, as you said, but uh, as a programmer looking at your your uh, application, I'm always very critical of other people's application. We're all like that, right? We're all, we're all like, oh, he did it this way, you know, but uh, but it's good. It's, it's extremely impressive. And uh, I think what's more impressive is you're using just stock components. Yeah. Uh, when I when I code, you know, if I write a FireMonkey application, um, I have this traditional different views. So I do the one master layout, and then in the FireMonkey um, uh, form editor, I'll then choose one for Android and one for um, iOS, because I tend to render those slightly differently. Um, yeah, yeah, of, of yeah, course. You know. if, if, if XA2 had already had this functionality, I probably would use it, but uh, if I, Perhaps if I would start a new application with Rio at the moment, I perhaps I would use it. But uh, in in the old days with XE two, three, four, and so on, there was no such uh, uh, overloading multi, multi for different uh, yeah. uh, platforms. And so I do. I've done it on my own. So I can show you this this calendar uh, functionality. Um, okay, it's this is still dark mode. I don't know why. Uh, let me just. Restart it. Um, and this is running in debug mode. So if yeah, so you're running on Windows, but actually you're you're running the compiler on Windows, obviously. Um, yeah, but course, the application yes. is is then running on the. Uh, on the Linux box, and that's using PA server for those people yes. listening who yes. are not quite sure how that works. Yeah. So as you can see, this this stuff is rendered on the fly, and um, in my webinar uh, at the 11th of November, 
I show how I create this uh, kind of stuff. And the funny part is, as you can see, this is 100% scalable. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's nice. I like it. I I think you're doing everything the hard way, but <laughs> but it's extremely yeah. impressive. And I and I think that as you say, the reasoning behind it was that you started on XE2. Yes. And then uh, progressed through the compilers up to Rio as it is now. And, uh, yeah, and I, can, I I have applications that are the same. I have what one one of our um, um, major applications is all VCL and uh, and uses a lot of um, old stuff because it started out as a Delphi 7 application. And with most commercial projects, it's about, yes, we want to overcome our technical debt and wipe it all out and, and redo it all with FireMonkey and all the exciting things. But yeah, the reality I, I, is, I, you know. I know this enough. approach. Uh, for, yeah. for many years, <laughs> we are starting, we have started our main business here uh, with um, Tor Pascal 3. Uh, mm -hmm. up to uh, Bolin Pascal, up to Delphi 2, uh, and I think with up to, let's say, the year 2008 or 9, we were able to compile with Delphi and Turbo Pascal the same source code to a DOS application and also to a Windows application. <laughs> Uh, yeah, nowadays, that's... of course, we are just uh, compiling to uh, to uh, to Windows anymore. So there's no DOS application anymore. But uh, for many years, we could produce uh, a DOS application, text mode, and a Windows application with the same source code. Wow! You know, that's one of the things I love about uh, Delphi is that it it respects your investment as a developer in your code base, right? So that you can move it forward like that. So you can take this project you started a number of years ago, and you're like, oh, I want to add uh, Linux support, you know, boom, boom. Hey, look, I'm now, you know, 80%, 90% of the way there to having my app fully working on Linux in just a few minutes oh. by using the latest version. So yeah, that's fantastic. And then, yeah. It, it, and then, and like you said, you can throw it out and say, hey, let's just throw it all out and rewrite it. You can do that, but you don't have to do that, right? So you can yes. you can add the new features, go back and refactor it and take advantage of new features for the platform and stuff like that as you need to, as you want to move forward. And that just lets you, you know, keep shipping code, which is really what it's all about. Yeah. And, and, and really, that is the secret of why there are people like me out there who, you know, I can code in C Sharp. I've been a COBOL program. I've been a you know, C program and various other things, but I keep using Delphi because as I keep saying to people, Delphi is my superpower. That's how I can be more productive than a lot of other programmers in a kind of weird and upsetting way for the other programmers. But, you know, I, I bang out a lot of code, a lot of applications on my own mostly. And, uh, you know, it just works. We can't have us shipping to thousands of customers and have lots and lots of things that just don't work because if we did that the company you know that I write for would go bankrupt they just couldn't possibly uh, you know hire enough support people and make it um, um, worth their while financially and I think you know with things like MIDA converter out there and and some of the other tools uh, the trend I personally feel is to go from VCL towards um, FireMonkey. I, I, I prefer the FireMonkey platform for new things. Um, but the problem is, of course, that there's so much code, you know, that I've got, uh, the same as Frank, hundreds of thousands of lines of code that are VCL based. And so, you know, I mean, as much as you try and divorce the user interface from the logic behind the scenes that's making the thing work, in practice over years, you know, a 20 year project, it doesn't work quite like that. So. Yeah, it, well, one of the issue, issues with that is that as much as you put the business logic and the data in a separate layer, the reality is is there's a lot of code related to how you render that in the UI. So yeah. you still have to have it in there. You still have to deal with that. So yeah. Yeah, and and the best practices are best practices, but it means that you know in an ideal world you can you you, you will do everything properly and of course you know there are techniques like dependency injection and stuff like that that help and make sure that you're not uh, getting units that don't compile under uh, Linux um, because there's some kind of weird um, accidental dependency on a, on a Windows unit uh, and the same you know as soon as you start using Android and uh, iOS 
and Windows, then you start realizing that you've written some code there that relied on some kind of hard-coded backslash in a path that you shouldn't have done. Yeah, so, if, if there, there, there are often many questions on Facebook and in, in other bulletin boards or whatever you call it nowadays. Um, do you use FMX or VCL if you start a new Windows application? And my answer is 100% forget about VCL, take FMX. And they ask why? It's the, it's the Windows only application. And I can tell you because FMX is so much better. It's so much faster. Uh, as you can see, um, if, you, if you start an application with, with many controls on it, uh, on a form in, in VCL, um, there are hundreds of events, VM, user, VM, pain messages fired to the Windows VCL stuff. And you can see how the window is redrawed, if you, uh, especially if, uh, if you have a slow computer, but uh, also on a fast computer. And FMX, as it's nearly working as a game engine, it's able to render everything. And of course, with a proper GPU installed, much faster as everything else. Um, sure. And with one refresh cycle of your screen, the whole screen is rendered, and that's it. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I've done some tests, and I do many uh, many tests in this in this scenario. Um, uh, so FMX is much faster on on simple applications for data handling or whatever you call it, yeah. and that's that's the trick. And, uh, um, and, I, and I think I, I agree with you, Frank. That. I think if someone was saying to me, what, what should I use, FMX or, or VCL? There are some reasons why you would use the VCL, but I, my preference would be FMX. The only thing that happens is that some of your UI code, um, you know, you're going to be writing to builds, uh, properties of controls that are different, you know, text instead of caption and things like that. But there are so many advantages to um fmx in terms of embedding controls in one another and yeah it's yeah it's yeah, so easy to, to design yes sure and animations and stuff like that you know animations that just add that extra uh, kind of fizzle to your application they make your application look more modern and that's really what we're aiming for because people you know buy with their eyes when you're trying to sell your application to someone, if your application looks ugly or if it looks old or if it is just plain, you know, you click and something happens, some people will like that. They'll go, yeah, I like I like it to be plain, ordinary application I can understand straight away. But actually, the reality is a lot of people, when they're comparing your application to another person's application, if you've matched all the features between the two applications, the one that will get the sale or the one that people will download if, the, if it's a free application is the one that looks pretty and, and has got that extra little, you know, if you click on something, the button is animated to show what they call affordance in, in the, in the uh, right. user experience design. So. Yeah, the, okay, so um, the problem is um, if you start with, with uh, FireMonkey now, Okay, this is this kind of caption text thing. Okay, this is this is a stupid detail. Same with left and and top against X and Y. Okay, but that's <laughs> it. But that's it. Okay, Padding. nearly 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 yeah, nearly everything else is the same, and you can embed it controls into controls. And um, if if uh, if you know my my Fire Monkey development kit, spoiler alert, I will show this stuff uh, in my webinar, um, and also uh, I I will show some little uh, frames of my um, MVVM framework. Also, if you if if you use these two libraries for me, I can build an app in minutes with everything you need, uh, web interface, JSON, REST service, SQLite, database access, and so on. Mm. And, and that's the trick. So if you, if you start from scratch, and uh, last week I had some uh, guys here from Germany for, for four days of uh, tutorial about starting up with FMX and MVVM. Um, if I, I can tell you some basics and, and give you some uh, kind of uh, framework. 
you be able to do your first MVVM FMX app in 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 three days or whatever. And and that's the trick, I think. Um, there are many tutorials in VCL, and there are less tutorials in FMX um, for for doing real application. You find many many tutorials about little stuff, but not for building a complete application. And um, yeah, um, if I find the time, I will do this kind of webinars um, in in the first. Uh, first of uh, of first months of 2020. Frank, there's a question here for you, um, and maybe this is something you're gonna cover in your webinar next week. The, uh, this would it be beneficial to show how the floating containers are done inside the IDE? Earlier when you're showing how things are moving around and stuff. Yeah, uh, this, this is not, I, I did not use the floating controller. Um, I, I can, if you, if you like, I can, I can show you a quick demo. This is, uh, uh, this is, this is easy. Um, so uh, one, one, one major part of, of FMX is you can embed it stuff. So uh, let's say uh, take a T-edit, uh, take a label, and just drag the label onto the edit. Um, go to the edit label, go to position, um, and just said uh, minus 21 and zero for the X. And yeah, then you can name it like a uh, name and you can also um, put this stuff into it, uh, name. And so you can, you see, X and Y is not just related to the boundaries of the parent control. You can also take it at minus 21. And if you drag your edit around, uh, all components are followed. So uh, my main approach is always um, to take a layout and place it somewhere. And take another form and take a layout, make this layout client and put some edits into it or whatever. Okay, uh, that's it. Just compile this stuff for the moment. Okay, so of course, um, this is the main form. And here we go. Um, in the, uh, this is the main form. Here we go. Um, in the create of the main form, because I, I have, created them um, at startup now. Um, both are created at this time, okay? So um, I can do So real quick, I just want to add something here. Uh, there's a couple of comments and questions about why you use FMX and stuff like that. I, I do want to point out that uh, it, you may have missed the news, but uh, Linux compiler is now part of Delphi. This isn't Kylix. This is a whole new Linux 64 compiler. And FMX Linux is also included with that now, so that if you have the latest version of Delphi, you can install FMX Linux from the Git Package Manager. And uh, if you have uh, uh, Delphi, Enterprise, latest version Delphi Enterprise, then you have the full FMX Linux stack so that you can build uh, GUI applications like you see here on Linux. So uh, that's what, what you're seeing here. There's such some questions around that. And I do like your comment here, uh, Ian, about uh, the question was about why you'd use FMX and Linux instead of using some sort of hybrid between Lazarus and Delphi. Uh, it, FMX Linux is, is in the box. So having it all in one stack in one project and being able to do it 
all with one uh, solution, I think it is a better solution. But yes, if you want to combine it with something else, like you said, Python and Sharp, you can certainly do that too. Although I have no idea why you would want to do that to yourself, but there you go. <laughs> yeah. You know, and the reality is, be <laughs> the, it's all, in my, opinion, my, my mind, it's all about having a very diverse and flexible set of tools that you can use to solve problems. And so sometimes you might have a situation where someone comes and says, oh my goodness, I have this existing Lazarus system. Can you, you know, put some code behind this to make, to do the business logic? Okay, sure. I, can do that. I right. had almost exactly that situation. I, we had a project out there that was written using IntraWeb. Um, which is a great technology, a little bit kind of quirky now and again, because we've been through the versions over the years. And some of them are not quite as good as they are now. And uh, it could be a little bit uh, fussy. And uh, that was a very successful project. And in fact, what has happened is that um, the, the people that I write software for, because I work for myself, but I contract out to various people, have said, OK, we want a new project that does this, 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 and this. And of course, they're targeting mobile. And they did initially say, can't we just take this intraweb uh, project and and uh, have it on those devices as a web app? And I said, why don't we take what we've got there and um, make some FireMonkey views, you know, screens, and then we can use all the code in the background that already uh, um, is uh, is written um, for the intraweb um, tool, and uh, then I can target iOS. I can target Android, I can target uh, Windows tablets, uh, you know, like the Surface Go and things like that. And the best of it is they are native apps. They're not yeah. a web app. We don't have to have something running on the, on the server there. We can have it there. And there was a big discussion about this, and they said, well, prove it. So I did that. It took me about three hours to literally take the intro web screens, lay them out in FireMonkey, and boof, it was working. And... Uh, That'll be released next year as a project. So you know, yeah. it's, uh, things evolve over time, and uh, there are good reasons to use VCL uh, um, components. But uh, I, I think that if you're going to start a new project, and there is a possibility that you're going to do things in the future that are cross-platform, and that's going to happen. Do you want to target Mac natively? Do you want to target uh, Linux natively? Then, um, then. Uh, you starting out with a FireMonkey project uh, for FMX is, is definitely yeah. um, it's going to give you options even if you don't use them in the end. And there's there's not really a massive amount of downside to uh, using FMX. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Frank, okay. so, so people are asking if you could make your uh, text or font a little bit bigger. It's hard to read. Uh, there's one question there as well. Whilst we're doing that, um, asked about making a multi-view application in FMX. Um, I'm not quite sure what, what they mean by multi-view. Um, do they mean um, do they mean multiple screens as you go through, or do they mean uh, a, a detail and uh, a head of view? Um, in fact, I'll answer that question and let them reply. But uh, the answer is in FMX, if you actually go and say file new and go into there, there are lots of little different templates that come up um, when you say uh, multi-device uh, um, application. There could well be one that you're already asking about. If not, there are lots of demos out there that um, are multiple screens, they're saying. OK. Um, yeah, you, it, FMX is just a rendering technology. So multiple screens, you just create multiple forms if you can have a multi-form um, app of course. that you've got uh, like that. But you can, of course, if you really uh, want to, have a massive, great big um, form that fills across the screens, plural. I don't know why you would do that. That's not normal um, to stretch your application across, say, two or three monitors. But it's um, also working, of course. But yes, but it works. I mean, uh, the thing that people, uh, if you're not familiar with it, the thing you need to remember is that it's still Delphi, and the forms pretty much are the same. So what you were doing with forms before is still the same, uh, you know, in VCL as it is in uh, FireMonkey, FMX. The only difference is that the controls are rendered. The thing that goes on behind the screens, uh, behind the scenes to do the drawing is a different technology. It's not using Windows code to do that. It's using its own internal FireMonkey code, which is cross-platform. Now, at the lowest level, there are they are determining whether there's certain APIs available and 
and drawing Windows handles and things like that, or uh, or a Linux Windows handle, depending on uh, which which platform you're targeting. But actually, really, you know, if you start to code in FireMonkey, you'll find that it's just like you used to do with the VCL stuff. It's really not a massive leap. The only things are a couple of different properties on on controls and things like that, which confuse you. But uh, but uh, like, apart from that, it's the same. It's the same. He's saying not mon across multiple but multiple forms for a step sequence of navigation. So you could do, um, oh, what's it called? The uh, page control. That's not the right one. Is that the page control? The one that has the multiple tabs? Yes, it, it's the page control. Or the this um, the page control's got tabs, and then there's another one called uh, card view. Which is like the old um, notebook that you used to get in the Windows 3.1 tab on earlier versions of Delphi. In fact, it's still there. Um, this, this is not this is normal. The trick with this tab control, you you're faking this kind of multi frames on mobile devices. Well, that, that's one way of doing it, and also there is another way from um, Andrea Magni, uh, who is another MVP for the French and stuff. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yes, and he's got a, a component called T Frame View, I think. Frame um, stand. Which is, a frame stand, yes, that's right. And there's also a companion one called T Form Stand. Um, if people want to look at that, that is an absolutely amazing component. What that allows you to do is to embed um, either a frame, and if you haven't used frames before, they're they're like mini forms that aren't forms. You put a bunch of controls on them, and then drop them onto a form. It's a good way of uh, encapsulating uh, functionality of the controls. Yeah, this is, this uh, is nearly the same I've done here. I can I can just show it. So this sure. is the main form with, with one component, and this is just a T-layout controller. And the other form is has only one uh, edit box here. And with, with, uh, with a simple line of setting the parent to the parent, um, you can just embed the one form into the other form, and that's it. Yeah, so it renders inside. And Andrea's um, uh, T form stand and T um, frame stand do a lot of automation of that. Yes. Um, it, in behind, behind the scenes, it's also allowing you to do things like animation between the multiple um, screens uh, uh, that Alessandro is talking about. Um, in fact, I... I oh. oh. Before, can you go back to that project and show how to add FMX Linux as a project? There's a question about that. Oh, yeah, no problem. Um, okay. Sorry, I didn't mean uh, No, no problem. No, no, that's fine. Um, so, um, okay, I I have the normal uh, listing here from Android, iOS, macOS, and Windows. And you can just click here, add Linux platform, and it should be normally available directly. Um, and of course it's working, so PA server is running. And if I hit run, it's compiled for Linux and um, I can switch to my Ubuntu system. And here we go. Here we have the little app I just created. Now, I thought usually don't you click on the uh, project itself and say add FMX, add Linux, FMX Linux? Correct, that's what you do. You have to save it first and do that, yeah. Yeah. So you right click, right click and say add that to the add platform. You've already yes. added it. Yeah, that's it. Yep. So, simple. And I can show you uh, where do we have this stuff i'm just preparing uh, the code rage session here and you can see this is uh, the start of the application i will show next week and um, this is also uh, be able to run on every platform with fmx and also with uh, vcl with the same source code behind so here we go. Uh, I hope this little demo is working. Yes. Um, so uh, as you can see, I have a VCL application. I have an FMX application, and I've also a, a test application here, also test uh, stuff. And um, I have an FMX frame here with just an edit on it. 
and you see there's no code behind, no fancy stuff inside the view. Uh, the only thing um, you have to do is uh, just one uses here. And uh, the same is with VCL. And um, there's no fancy stuff, just uses here. And um, I have, of course, a view model and also the test project here with a day unit X test. And I can run some tests here. And hope it's working. Yes, uh, you saw it perhaps. Uh, this was the test inside from Stefan Glinke. I can, uh, where do we have this stuff? Um, test inside Explorer. Here we go. If, you, if you're working with, with, with unit tests, uh, of course, you have to use Stefan Glinke's test inside with everything. Um, this improves your your work uh, so so hard. It's it's unbelievable. Oh yeah, uh, big especially if you click this little icon here uh, for for testing. And um, if if you break something um, and just hit uh, save, the unit test is running in the background, and you can see oh I've break some code. Oh yes, this is, here's a typo. Just save it. It's running again in the background, and you see, oh, everything is green, ship it. <laughs> okay, and um, yeah, this is a funny part. Um, I, I have this FMX view. I have a view model for it. Um, it's all automated. I've done some fancy uh, framework stuff. So you see there's no real property here, just, just the edit as a property. It's binding by name. It's also bindable by attributes. And um, yes, for, for the unit test, um, I use this test view with a special component uh, uh, behaving like this was, would be an edit control. So I can uh, test the view model and also the view and also uh, some kind of integration test uh, to uh, test both of it uh, working together. And yeah, this, this one line of code, you can, can do all this stuff, um, especially in the project file. You'll see um, there's just one call to, to the constructor of the composition and that's it. Everything else is done in the framework. So this is, you're showing off some of the stuff you're gonna be covering next week with your session. You'll probably have the code available then for everybody? Um, I, I would show some kind of this stuff, but uh, the main part of my webinar next week is about uh, the um, creation of uh, application at runtime. Um, and I'm using my calendar uh, component and some other fancy stuff you can use with the fluid design. Um, I can hope I can show you this, uh, uh, my calendar stuff here. Um, normally, if you if you create uh, a list box item or everything else, you have to do item uh, create, item X, item Y, uh, item more, item action, item text, item detail, item everything. And um, as part of this framework, you can config some stuff here. And um, if I want to create a label, or in this one is a month label for the calendar, I just say create default with a parent, with a client, horizontal center, font bold, hit test, and that's it. But more next week. <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard to, to show a fancy component like my fluid creator uh, in 10 minutes, but uh, perhaps I do the preview at the next week and uh, a, a more detailed video on my YouTube channel. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, so a few people saying that they're having trouble finding how to access FX Linux. So just to reiterate, the it's available in Enterprise. So you have to have Rio Enterprise uh, updated 10.3.2. And then 
you have to install FMX Linux through Git. I realize it's different in that you have to add the FMX Linux. The reason it's different is because this was a originally a third party framework that we've now included as part of Delphi and Rad Studio. In 10.4, we are going to uh, streamline that a lot more to make it easier to work with. If you uh, want more information about FMX Linux specifically, there is a webinar on the playlist that goes into uh, showing you how to do this. I'll put the link in here as well for it, but uh, that will give you a lot more basic introduction to how to uh, to work with that. You should have, it's actually it's in the email you got for this session, this webinar today. There's a playlist, a YouTube playlist that has uh, a whole bunch of FMX, um, or FMX Linux and Linux related content. Of, of course, you need the, the, the Linux compiler stuff included in the enterprise version, not in the uh, free or normal version, right? Not in the professional. Linux is not included in the professional nowadays. And people are asking if that's going to change. I don't know that's currently planned, although there is a really good promo right now to upgrade from pro to enterprise. So um, certainly could check that out if you're currently on pro and want to have Linux. Um, so what about multimedia features of FMX on Linux? Uh, uh, audio, 3D models, motion, virtual reality, extended reality, et cetera. I know that I've done some more experiment with the uh, the media player component on Fire Monkey for Linux, and it uses you actually have to install have uh, VLC installed in the background because it uses VLC for the rendering, which is great. That means all the stuff renders. Uh, it doesn't actually launch VLC; it actually uses VLC's libraries for that. Have you guys done anything else with the uh, 3D and stuff like that? On I know it does 3D. I've done a little bit with that, but I haven't done a whole lot with it. No, I've only really played with the demo <laughs> for, right. for the 3D. <laughs> Yeah, it does basic 3D stuff. I have not done a lot with it, but you certainly could um, do that. Um, I mean, it seemed to work. Uh, the, the demo I, I ran under Ubuntu, and uh, you could drag uh, around the um, the cube. That I think it draws a cube. Yeah, I'm sure it's not another one I'm thinking of, but you can drag a cube around in 3D. For the um, multimedia, uh, m multimedia on Linux is a, is a well-known beast anyway. And uh, I think um, adding um, adding a third party um, app to um, uh, you know like VLC, which is a very well known and well respected um, product, I think makes a lot of sense because um, back in the day when I used to write C programs that worked under Linux, it, it, uh, one of the ones I did was actually something that played movies. Um, it was a patient education program. And uh, we tried making it work under Linux, and in the end, we gave up because it was just so difficult to get two customers who were, had Linux installed um, to to be able to have the right bits uh, installed for the the project to work. And this this was in C, so um, um, you know it's moving forward. I think um, the distributions are much more stable and much more sensible, and tend to have all the things you would expect to find on there as long as you're aiming at sort of a common denominator. But um, um, using VLC to uh, to do the rendering of the uh, the audio and the uh, the video makes a lot of sense. I think I've not done it, but it sounds like a great idea. Yeah, as far as doing VR uh, and uh, uh, augmented reality stuff like that, you could leverage a third party framework. So there's a third party framework you want to use that supports that for a specific platform like that. You can do that. Although I know a number of MVPs that have uh, built their own. Um, 3D and VR systems using FireMonkey from scratch. Um, so you can certainly do all that as well. It re really depends on what you're trying to accomplish and how you want to get there, but uh, you can you can absolutely do that. I bet all of those those uh, uh, MVPs that do that have got very long hair, very long beards, walk around and mutter to themselves because they can be the only people that would ever design their own VR platform. <laughs> I think oh, it's not a crazy all. thing to do. <laughs> oh my God, they must you know, be. There's uh, a lot of there's Rocket a lot scientists. of uh, <laughs> younger MVPs that are coming in now and that are doing a lot of really great, crazy stuff. So uh, just they're excited and doing stuff as well. So it's it's we got the full spectrum there. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I mean, people like Francois, um, who who is um, uh, he? I forget what his app is called, but it's a dating app, and his is absolutely amazing. His demo, yeah. Of, yeah. 
That's it. Yes, kiss, kiss. Absolutely incredible. I mean, I, I talked to him a fair few times about various program things, but he, he's an example of someone who is just at the top of his game in terms of of uh, visual development and stuff like that. And uh, it's great. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, and he has all the um, all the oh, I can't think of what it's called now. All the live, so he's bit, built a lot of his own code and stuff like that as well, and it's all available on yeah. GitHub. So. Yeah, and I, I actually contribute towards that project to answering questions and things like that because he got, gets a lot of questions uh, from people, and um, I think they're too many for him he to actually answer on his own. It's uh, what does GitHub amazing, called? Really. GitHub. I, uh, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's it's called. Um, I need to check. I'll find out. I'll come come back to you in a minute. Hold on. <laughs> uh, Keith, if you're having trouble. Um, you have Enterprise, you installed it through GitIt, and you have 10.3.2. You don't see Linux as one of the targets in the installer. Hmm. Uh, I'm not sure. So you may need to contact, uh, so support has, uh, you get free uh, installation support. It sounds like it might be an installation issue. If you have, uh, 10.3.2 Enterprise, you should certainly have Linux as an option. Uh, okay, so there's a few more questions here. Uh, I'm trying to keep up on the questions. If I've missed your question and we still haven't got an answer yet, feel free to put it in here again. We're almost the top of the hour running out of time here. Uh, it says, I have C++ Builder Enterprise and Delphi Pro. I am having to port code into Delphi as C++. And, uh, uh, we have is it possible to swap my pro if so if you yeah rob talk to sales um can't you maybe answer the phone in uk uh let me i i don't know that i can so you would need to talk to someone in uk uh you might try sending them an email that's that's odd that you're having trouble getting a hold of somebody there um try sending them an email uh it's one of those things, phone and email usually works like 90% of the time, but then there's like 10% of the time it just doesn't work, and I don't know what to tell you. But uh, you, you'd you have to talk to sales about swapping between uh, your licenses like that. Um, how well does FireMonkey integrate with FireDAC DB drivers? Um, it seems easier to carry out. So you, FireDAC does require that you have the the db drivers installed on the platform um because so it's one of those things that the database manufacturers say we want you to use our drivers to talk to our databases and so as being a good citizen in the software community we try like okay we will use your drivers to talk to your databases so they that's a requirement by the db manufacturers to do that, so you would need to install the MySQL database drivers, and then you can um, uh, then you can uh, reach the MySQL database with FireDAC. The FireDAC uh, is on Linux should support, I think, all the databases. There may be one or two databases that aren't supported on Linux. I can't remember if like Microsoft SQL Server is, um, because the driver the the way the driver is written is such that it, it's specific to Windows, but that may be fixed by now. I'm not sure. Um, but there may be a couple uh, of that don't work. I, I do quite a lot of stuff with MySQL, and I can tell you that one of the drivers that I found to be better is the MariahDB um, driver. Um, there's a MariahDB.lib, and you can use that with FireDAC, which is what I'm doing. And uh, they've got some versions for um, most targets. I, I can't remember Linux because I've not done that directly, but um, uh, I found that with the MariahDB, I could um, actually access more versions of MySQL with more um, diverse configurations of the security um, settings because older versions of MySQL, um, uh, they change the way the password algorithm worked um, between one version and another, and sometimes you come across these um, these versions and you can't actually access it unless you make some changes to the uh, MySQL configuration, but MariahDB seems to be able to talk to everything. And in fact, um, Heidi SQL, which is a, a Delphi project, which is um, open source and um, accesses all sorts of uh, MySQL and 
and uh, MariaDB. They, they use MariaDB driver as well, so um, that would be my advice. <laughs> yeah, this, 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 is, uh, is, this is a real common question about um, what's about MySQL on mobile platforms. And um, usually the answer is uh, don't use um, MySQL on a mobile device uh, with uh, a direct connection to a to to a MySQL server. Uh, you won't, uh, you shouldn't do this to put a, a MySQL server open to the internet. You should always use some kind of uh, web Middleware. service yeah. to uh, to access the, uh, the server. And and um, you can you can do this with some with two clicks and some lines of code with bare bones dot components uh, out of Red Studio, and this this is not a tricky application. You just create uh, say for 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 Windows you create an ESRP DLL um, and uh, just install the DLL on on your server and just do some REST stuff with JSON. And you you've done you've done in done that in let's say 100 lines of code and you're done. So your app can talk to the web service and talk to the MySQL server and that's it. Don't bother the little devices with this direct access with MySQL drivers. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of middleware components out there as well, including things like Data Snap and. Also, you know, Aurelius from TMS, and um, uh, there's a there's a lot of ORM type um, uh, uh, database solutions. I think me, most of the component vendors have got some similar kind of um, idea. Yeah, so, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, there's always a scenario where you want a mobile app to do something that everybody says you shouldn't. <laughs> and, and you know, I'm a big fan of that, and I've done a few webinars in the past where I've like. Everybody says you can't do this and you shouldn't do this, but here's how to do it. And people are like, Jim, quit tell, doing that. And I'm like, well, sometimes you need to. So, uh, you know, be aware of what the what you're supposed to do. And but you know, if you want to do it, do it anyway. Is my my opinion. Um, so, question here. Let's see. Is there a generic interprocess communication tool for Delphi apps running on Linux? For example, like you used to use as DCOM when. Uh, writing apps need to talk to each other. So I, if you're doing apps across multiple devices, you could certainly use um, app tethering. But if it's on the same device, multiple apps on the same device, I don't know, do either of you have any tips on that? I mean, you could use yeah, I, I would use uh, UDP or app tethering uh, the same way. There might yeah. be some some interchange stuff on 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 Linux and Unix and Ubuntu and Windows and everything else, but if you're using uh, UDP uh, or TCP/IP stuff uh, like in in app tethering, you are not bothering with any uh, drivers or stuff installed on the target system. So it's working out of the box with every device across devices, and that's it. Yeah, and you don't have to worry about weird messages and things like that. It's, yeah, right, it's right. the same for every platform. Right. Uh, and that's that's the problem that it used to be in the past. You would set up custom messages on Windows and send messages out to, you know, either broadcast or or um, to a specific app window. And that worked great. But as soon as you go to multi-platform, Mac does it differently, uh, iOS does it differently, and Android does it differently. And you can use things like um, Google's Fire um, DB as a, a, a sync and there are some other technology and I can't remember the name of it but there's a simple messaging um, protocol that you can use as well I wish I could remember it but it, it, I've done it in the past you it, it's a it, it's like a technology where there's an endpoint and you all send messages to that endpoint and uh, everybody can pick those messages up so it's a bit it's a bit like fire DB is uh, fire yeah, it, it, I think it's depending what your what your goal is uh, if you need uh, Bidirectional direct communication use something like UDP broadcast to find the other clients and then use yeah. a TCP. I think this and, is exactly what I do in, in and my yes, of course. And and the other part is if you if you find with a stateless connection, you can use a, a, a HTTP server in in one application and just call it. Yeah, I mean the solution I've used in in the, our biggest client server product 
is uh, when they log in, they need to select the server for the first time, and they can actually um, click on a button that says um, automatically find, and what it does is sends out UDP broadcast, and uh, the server recognizes this message and sends back and says, hello, I'm this server, and I understand this version, and then, yeah. uh, and then as long as they've got credentials to log in, they can log in with that. I, I, I think I have a, done a webinar or code rage in 2017 about this topic. Oh. Might be online or not. I, 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 I have to check. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so Rob said that. Um, uh, Rob, let me uh, copy email address. I'll see if I can yeah, connect you with someone, Rob, um, on that. It looks like Great Matter website's down, at least for me as well. So you could use Linux sockets as well. Yeah, Rob, you could, I mean, there's certainly lots of options you could use. There is a Linux, uh, uh, oh, what's it called? FIFO uh, named pipes, you can use sockets, you can use all sorts of things. There's there's plenty of options. Um, uh, yeah. It's not, it's not a big, it's not that it can't be done. It's just that there's a lot of answers, and it's picking the right one for you. I think is the answer. It's definitely doable. It's just which solution. Most people seem to use UDP and do it that way, and then create a TCP connection or something like that. But um, sending JSON, uh, or in my case, actually encrypted JSON uh, messages backwards and forwards, and um, you know the JSON web tokens and stuff like that you can use. But it just depends on. How far you want to go down that, you know, self-rolling your own solution um, route, or um, down the I'll oh, use something that's already made um, solution. But I think you, the more broad technology you use, um, the more likely it is to work in every scenario. I think if you start looking at Linux um, sockets, um, there are chances that you'll start, you know, coding a solution that isn't going to necessarily work across all platforms, and that could be a problem. Well, yeah, Frank, your YouTube link in the chat window there on the in. Uh, uh, yeah, you, you you can just go to my YouTube channel. Is uh, I've not done YouTube videos recently because you see it's from 2013. <laughs> um, but I can do it in the chat window, of course. Um, here we go. This should fit it. Yeah, it's, it's 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 old stuff, and of course it's German, and but uh, it's showing my my old app. You see, it's uh, it's uh, the same app I've showed you on on Windows and Linux, and um, I explain how to do your own protocol to talk over um, UDP and TCP/IP to from from your iPhone to your um, desktop application um, and of course this was pre app tethering was included in the RTL so no app tethering at this time yeah so don't forget this <laughs> nowadays I would use app tethering or whatever um, but um, in the old days with XA I think two four two three four uh, there was no app tethering so I, I've done it with barebone uh, in the UDP TCP IP Good. There are a lot of questions. Obviously, we uh, we're either um, provoked a lot of people into thinking about uh, the subject, or <laughs> we're just in the right place at the right time for everybody to go. And another thing I need to know. So <laughs> where these things go, isn't it? Sometimes. Yeah, do, doing doing live stuff is is sometimes a little bit tricky. As you saw the exceptions in my 3D stuff. I don't know why. Perhaps it's because of screen scripter. I don't know. Um, if you are able to prepare things, it's it's just e it's much easier. So um, um, if you have any questions uh, about FMX or doing stuff, uh, you can just email me, or, or um, perhaps I can do some webinars in the future about this, uh, the questions. Um, I would love to. Yeah, so that's great. There was a question here about accessing COM ports and such. There was a, let's see if I can find it here. I'm not sure if there's components out there specifically for that on Linux. There probably are. Although one thing about Linux, kind of, well, the idea behind Unix and then Linux emulates is that um, 
you can do everything via another command line program or a file on the file system or something like that. So there's all sorts of things you can do. Uh, here we go, working with Linux libraries in Delphi, let me paste this uh, URL in here, or this YouTube video in the chat window. Um, so you can certainly do it with uh, just using it through the uh, command line interface on Linux as well. So that's, that's kind of the philosophy behind Linux, is that you can, uh, there is a program, command line program or file system or something like that that you can use to access everything that you would want to do on Linux. And so Every, everything is a file under Unix and Linux. Yes, exactly, exactly. Oh, hey, there's your email address and everything, Frank. Fantastic, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so if if there are any questions about FMX, uh, just give me a call or email, Skype, whatever. All right. Well, I think we've answered hopefully all the questions here, probably a couple different ways. Um, Okay, well, yeah. thank you so much, Frank and Ian, for hopping on and helping out with this today. Um, there's, we have a lot more content coming up next week, including Frank's session, and I think, I can't remember, if, Ian, if you have one next week or not, but we have a lot of other MVPs with sessions next week on, um, more on FireMonkey then, so hopefully you will register and sign up for that as well, and uh, we will see you all online next week. Okay, well, goodbye from Texas, everybody, and thanks for joining the webinar. Yeah, also a goodbye from Germany. Um, and if we, I think if I find the time, I will, of course, we do a, a, a English version of the webinar. But if I find the time, I will also do a German undertitles. Um, yeah, I, 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 I try. <laughs> and Miguel, I just real quick, you said something along the line, about asking about C++ for Linux. Email David Millington, which is david.millington at embarcadero.com, and uh, he's the uh, C++ product manager, and explain why uh, it's important and what the what the business is, impact is to you, and he can certainly uh, have conversations with upper management about, about the, the planning of those features and such. So if, if that is something that is uh, having a big impact on you, let David Millington know, and he can... Uh, can have co the conversations to, to change that in the future. So, all right. Thanks so much and talk to everybody later. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.